Welcome to the Bible Forum. I am Warren Sprouse. This is April 8th, the April 8th edition, 2018 of the Bible Forum. The Bible Forum is brought to you each and every week by Alternatives, Biblical Counseling and Education. Alternatives is a non-profit corporation providing the average person with practical understanding from the Word of God. We do a lot of different kinds of things. We are looking at life through a biblical perspective, drawing from the news of the week, and then demonstrating the biblical implications and oftentimes applications to what we read or what we see. We offer practical insight and some understanding. We also stream the Bible Forum live each and every Sunday night from 8 until 10 p.m. Eastern. Sometimes we go over time. Uh, We do this from our website. The website is thebibleforum.net. At the same time, we're simulcasting from our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Bible Forum. And then we archive the show on both platforms, plus on our YouTube channel. A link for the YouTube channel is found at thebibleforum.net. There are other websites that we make available. One is a biblical counseling website. It's trybiblicalcounseling.net. There's another one uh, offering practical application to life situations from a biblical perspective called livinggodly.net. And then there's one that's a little more secular. Uh, We're looking at the news and the world and projecting what we believe is happening uh, as the world is coalescing and God is working his plan. And we call it the view from Zoar.com. Zoar was the hillside from which Lot was able to watch the cities of the plain as God was destroying them because of their sin. And then there's our Bible Institute. You can find that at BibleInstituteOfCharleston.org, where you can take some basic Bible courses. Each of those websites are available uh, on our main website, thebibleforum.net. There are links to everything. Uh, You can go there and get answers to most of your questions. But if you have a question, any kind of a question, something that we've talked about something in the news, something in your life, don't be afraid to ask. Write to us at thebibleforum at gmail.com and we'll work on that. Maybe I'll get you a personal response or maybe it'll be a response from the next Bible forum. Don't know. There have been a number of things occur this week in our news that are of note uh, from a biblical perspective. Uh, These are things that tickle my fancy, aggravate my ire, uh, get me worked up sometimes, or just are cute. But the one that kind of was a a no-brainer this week was the controversy that seemed to swirl around Facebook. And I just wonder if I'm the only one who knew that Facebook was and is not a safe place. Zuckerberg and other top managers are making the rounds to assure us that all that Facebook does uh, doesn't actually exist to market our information. Well, you got to ask, do they not know what the internet is? If you're not paying for it, You are the commodity. They're taking your information. They're using it in a hundred different ways. Do they not know what people are? People are not nice. They say things, do things. Are they not in business to make money? You can't make money giving stuff away. Personal information of all sorts is the business of the internet. And you enter at your own risk. You didn't know that? Here's a reality check. An economics professor at a local college made a statement that he had never failed a single student before. 
Never, that is, until now. This was a class that had insisted that socialism was not only workable, it worked. And that no one would be poor and no one would be rich, that socialism is the great equalizer. So the professor said, all right, we'll have a little experiment in this class based on your plan. All the grades will be averaged and everyone will receive the same grade. So no one will fail and no one will receive an A. The A would substitute for dollars, something closer to home, more readily understood by these college students. Well, the predictable happened. After the first test, the grades were averaged and everybody got a B. The students who studied hard were very upset and the students who studied little were tickled. <laughs> As the second test rolled around, the students who studied little had studied even less. And the ones who had studied hard decided it wasn't worth it, and they wanted a free ride too, so they studied little. So the second round of testing produced an average grade of D, D as in dog. And of course, the third test scored an F. As the term proceeded, the scores stayed low, the students stayed angry, bickering, blame, name-calling ensued, and no one would study for the benefit of anyone else. To their great surprise, they all failed. And the professor told them that socialism would also ultimately fail, because when the reward is great, the effort to succeed is great. But when government takes all the reward away, no one will try and no one will want to succeed. What did they learn? Well, in the learn long term, politically, probably nothing. But the obvious lessons are right there in front of them. Number one, you cannot legislate the poor into prosperity by legislating the wealthy out. Secondly, what one person receives without working for, another person must work for without receiving. Thirdly, the government cannot give to anyone anything that the government does not first take from someone else. Fourthly, you cannot multiply wealth by dividing it. And lastly, when half of the people get the idea that they don't have to work, because the other half is going to take care of them, then when the other half gets the idea that it does no good to work because somebody else is going to get what they work for, it's the beginning of the end for any nation, any people group. But these are the lessons that our great-grandparents already knew. Our children today, it's brand new. Brand new information. They're shocked. And I say thank you, public school. Thank you, mainstream media. Thank you, liberal politician. You have seen high school and even grade school children out on the streets demonstrating against inanimate objects they sincerely believe kill people indiscriminately. So who are the enablers? Well, it's the same people who are being paid to teach them about the world and about reality. And this is what they're learning. A magazine is called Relevant Magazine is reporting that Covenant Church in Carrollton, Texas, chose to donate the funds they normally spend on advertising for their Easter service to families who were in need. The money the church gave to families who were unable to pay their medical bills totaled $10,551. Oh, I take that back. I read it wrong. $10 million dollars. 
$10,551,618. I hope that's a typographical error. Stephen Hayes, who pastors Covenant Church, knows what it's like to be buried under medical bills. After he was hit by a car at age 17, spent 12 days in ICU, his family struggled to pay off his medical bills until his church family stepped in to help. Hayes wanted to pay it forward and extend the generosity he had received to those who were also in need. And so that's what the church did. Anybody blame him? It's a beautiful sentiment. The underlying question, though, where did they get $10 million for advertising? Well, it probably wasn't all for advertising, and probably once they got started, other people jumped in. But can you imagine your church putting together $10 million? How about $10,000? According to faithwire.com, Stephen Colbert talked about his faith journey with Oprah Winfrey on one of her super soul conversations. In that conversation, Colbert said that Matthew 6.27 is what anchored him when he was having a faith crisis. Now, for your edification, the verse says, Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? That's a loose translation. Colbert told Oprah that he came across this verse as a young man when he received a Bible from the Gideons who were handing them out on the streets of Chicago. I was under the impression that Colbert came from South Carolina. Sidetrack. At this point in his life, Colbert says, I had lost my faith cannot lose what you do not have. And if you have it, you cannot lose it. When he opened the Bible, the pages just naturally fell open to Matthew 6, 27, and Colbert said, quote, it was the first time that I had read the Bible. Remember I said he lost his faith? He'd never read the Bible. I... Logic, facts, don't let any of this get in the way with the story. It's the first time I had read the Bible, and it just spoke to me right off the page. And the words of Christ are there for me. The words of Christ speak off the page. There's no effort for me to read them, he said. After going through a time of being, quote, so racked with anxiety, Colbert says the don't worry verse in Matthew was exactly what he needed to hear. Now, I teach the Bible, so I'm going to help you understand this. In Matthew chapter 6, there are at least six instructions. One says, do not your alms, do not your good works toward God relative to other people be seen of men. It also says, do not pray like the hypocrites who want to be seen doing it. It also says, do not use vain repetition when praying, like a rosary. It says, do not make a big deal about it when you fast before the Lord. And lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. It says, be careful what you look upon. If your eye is evil, the whole body is full of darkness. It says, you cannot serve two masters, God and mammon, earthly riches, acclaim. It says, do not focus on outward appearance. It says, do not worry about physical needs. Do not worry about tomorrow, but rather seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this other stuff God will take care of. The first time Stephen Colbert read the Bible, 
He didn't read any of those things, apparently. Have you been paying any attention to what's going on over in Israel? The world chooses to believe Israel to be a violent, murderous nation, a nation that does not belong to be there, a nation that took the property of other people and now is partitioned it off so they can't get back. And all you have to do is look at how they kill innocent Palestinian men, women, and children. You do know that that's what's going on, right? No. Palestinian leadership is linking a riotous attack by their people on the fences that divide Israel from the Gaza Strip with their effort to liberate Palestine. They're recruiting children in order to force Israel into hurting or even killing them in order to stop this incursion. They call it a march of return. A people who have never once ever lived in this place called Israel are now marching for return. Their parents and grandparents may have been there but it's been over 70 years. They've never been there. You do know that in the world, Arabs, by and large, make nothing. They build nothing. They have nothing. Their leadership cares nothing for them. What Arabs have in the Middle East, they have because of the oil that we found and drilled for and pump out of the ground and refine. We built all that up for them and they're wealthy as sin. And the common people over there are pawns in their religious leaders' effort to dominate the Middle East and to kill all the Jews because that's what it's about. You knew that, right? It's called this thing that they're doing a second march of return, a protest. They're burning tires. They're throwing Molotov cocktails at the soldiers guarding the fence. According to Hamas leaders, their effort is to use protesters as a diversion in order to, quote, open up the fence and insert terrorists into Israel, end of quote. And the international press? The press is worried that some of these people will be injured by Israeli efforts to stop them. The children, they cry. The Palestinian leadership is deliberately sending children. What about that? Well, this effort may last for quite a long time, or it may peter out like all the others. Friday's crowd was about half what it was earlier in the week. It was down to only about 15,000 people. But these terrorists never tire of sending others to die for Allah. And the world will never tire of blaming Israel for all of it. Hamas leaders claim they have surprises coming for Israeli defenses. We'll see. Rabbi Yosef Berger is the son of a widely revered Hasidic leader in charge of King David's tomb on Mount Zion. He told Breaking News Israel that he believes President Trump will play this, quote, final historic reparation for his entire nation, end of quote. He says, no leader in history has recognized Jerusalem as the capital of the Jews and Israel. He says President Trump has already created a great tikkun, a reparation for the Christians, through his unprecedented relationship with Jerusalem. Trump is a representative of Edom, he says, that will perform that final historic reparation for his entire nation by building the temple. Edom? 
Edom was believed to be a descendant of Jacob's twin brother Esau. Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel by God, Genesis chapter 32, a name that means he will rule as God. Edom is an ancient adversary of Israel founded by Esau. As the slightly older brother of Jacob, Esau famously rejected his birthright for a mess of pottage or stew when he was famished after a hunting excursion. Some ancient rabbis saw Edom as a spiritual progenitor of Christians. It's probably safe to say many of the ancient biblical characters are making a new entrance as Jews and Christians alike are beginning to look back in an effort to look forward. I tend to trust the Jewish experts in regard to what people group stems from which ancient patriarch. These things have been perennially, 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 got to get enough syllables in there, uh, vital to Israel for millennia. Meanwhile, Trump mania runs strong through Israel, according to public polls. Some of us are getting older. As we age, one of the things that happens is that we don't remember things quite as well. We can't recall things quite as quickly. Things that we've lived with, worked with, used for decades is, are in there, but it takes a minute to get them out. And sometimes they don't come out unless you can read or get something to remind you. And we'd never like that. Well, now... You can repair your brain. You can create miniature human brains, a millimeter long, with their own blood vessels. It's already been done. They have been grown for the first time in a laboratory. When implanted in a mouse for two weeks, scientists found that it had grown capillaries that penetrated all the way to its inner layers. Researchers at the University of California at Davis are hoping to use the artificial brain tissue to cure stroke victims. As they explain it, strokes occur when blood is blocked from the brain. This development not only offers a potential cure, but it has given scientists unprecedented insight into how the different regions of the brain work together. Today, surgeons may lay a portion of a patient's own artery on top of the brain in order to get the blood vessels to start growing. But that's about it. But in this experiment, the blood vessels actually began to self-assemble. Later, they discovered the blood vessels had developed their own capillaries. In the area of organ growth, scientists have been discouraged as they watch what they call the organoid grow larger, only to die at the center. This new technique appears to overcome that natural situation. It also ensures there will be no rejection. It's your tissue. It's your bloodstream. The research was published in the journal Neural Report and was given to us through the dailymail.com. But that's not the end of the story. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency is declaring success in its work to develop what they call fully implantable closed loop neural interfaces capable of restoring normal memory function their words. They're looking at military personnel who suffer brain injuries. Volunteers in the study demonstrated up to 37 percent improvement in the short-term working memory, short-term working memory over baseline levels. They're calling it restoring active memory, RAM. <laughs> Began in 2013. It is the only public data set of its kind, the feds are telling us. 
And the goal was an implantable interface for brain injured people, not just military, but anyone affected by Alzheimer's and other causes. RAM researchers at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center and the University of Southern California published in the Journal of Neuroengineering claim that they have demonstrated the first successful implementation in humans of a proof-of-concept system for restoring memory function by facilitating memory encoding using the patient's own neural codes. Inquiring minds want to know, however, can they also implant other memories? Other, meaning not yours. We don't know. The United States is third in murders throughout the world. Did you know that? We seem to kill people a lot faster than anybody else, except for the top two. But the statisticians, the scientists, the, the, the numbers people who look at these sorts of things tell us that if you take out just five cities, five American cities, then the United States goes from number three to fourth from the bottom in the entire world for murders. Which five cities? Chicago, Detroit, Washington, D.C., St. Louis, and New Orleans. Five cities controlled by liberals, by semi-socialists, by the Democrats, progressives, who have a better idea. Oh, and these five cities have the toughest gun control laws in America. I think it would be absurd to draw any conclusions from this data, right? According to a recent article in the Star Tribune, a Wisconsin man named Derek Hens, H-E-N-Z-E, -E, has begun mentoring young males through the creation of what he calls a Gentleman 101 class. Hens uses the class to teach high school boys how to act at proms, including how to dress appropriately how to treat a lady respectfully, how to interact with her parents, and in general how to greet and mingle with others in a civilized manner. Things that mama used to teach and daddy used to teach, but, you know, they're not around or they don't do it. Largely because it wasn't done for them either. The class has garnered attention and support from a number of venues, including local businessmen who have offered to foot the bill for these classes, as well as local women who have begun discussing the possibility of offering a similar class for young ladies. But adults are not the only ones supporting the class. The young men are big supporters of the class as well. The Star Tri Tribune has a lengthy article on this. A 16-year-old by the name of Cullen Kovac said he signed up to prepare for prom in May. He says, I feel more confident. I learned how to take a compliment and to be a leader. Now the question becomes, why? Why do these young people seem to revel in good, learning good manners? Well, the author believes there are three basic issues, three basic attitudes at work. Number one, there's an absence of male role models in our society. The 2010 U.S. Census found that a third of American children are growing up in a fatherless household. As such, many need to find a trusted mentor for, from whom they can learn both in word and deed. When that mentor is offering tips on how a boy can and should conduct himself with confidence, it's no surprise that young men would approach etiquette instruction with eagerness. They want to succeed. Secondly, the lack of adult interaction that's fostering disdain for those of other ages. 
ageism, we're calling it. Many young people enter the working world to find they don't know how to deal with people who are not their age. Manners instruction offers a different mindset that encourages children to feel more comfortable interacting with people of all ages. And thirdly, probably the most important, children thrive on structure and rules. Everybody knows that. Well, except for the experts today. But over 6,000 years, we've always known that. These two elements, structure, rules, are central to manners training. These two elements, structure, rules, are missing from the culture at large. More than that, they're actually shunned. The quality deemed most important seems to be creativity. And it's creativity no matter what. No boundaries. Note to self. These two elements are central to manners training. And while creativity is wonderful, it's difficult to cultivate unless there's a groundwork of rules and ideas laid first from which it can spring. Otherwise, all we have is chaos. Knowing these rules gives children a freedom that expands their mind and fosters greater creativity. Manners are not remnants of a stuffy society whose time is long past. Manners are applicable and welcomed by up-and-coming generations. They want to know how. The question is, will adults ever stand up? Will they actually train these children to have the wherewithal, the initiative to overcome these barriers, instilling these essential rules for living in the next generation? Will it happen? We can only pray. We heard this week some startling news out of Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman made history. He essentially told the world that as far as the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is concerned, the state that has stylized or styled itself the defender of Islamic holy places and thus the self-styled moral leader of the Arab and Muslim world, he has told us all that the long war against Zionism is over. He told the Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg that his country recognized the right of the Jews to their own land. He did, however, add that Saudis also care about the rights of Palestinians and the fate of the Holy Mosque in Jerusalem. The message he was sending to Muslims and Arabs was loud and clear. As far as the state which has styled itself the defender of Islamic holy places and thus the self-styled moral leader of the Arab Muslim world is telling the world that this long war against Zionism is over. Now, the news, as you might expect, did not make everybody happy. <laughs> Hamza bin Laden, son of Osama, went after the Saudi kin kingdom's relationship with America in a new video intended to incite Muslims to rise up against Middle Eastern rulers they see as too allied with the West. The video is the sixth the sixth episode in a series in which Hamza is seeking to motivate, quote, our dear people in the Arabian Peninsula, end of quote, to rise up against the criminal tyrants and rulers of the country. He emphasized that Al-Qaeda is motivated, quote, to liberate the place of revelation from the Crusaders and to protect the two holy mosques from the Savav, Savavids, and establish a complete and rightly guided Islamic system. Now, the place of revelation, that phrase is a reference to where Muhammad is supposed to have received word from Allah. That is an area in Jerusalem. Speaking of Saudi Arabia, Arabs, a new report by the Iraqi Human Rights Society 
has just revealed that Iraqi minorities, such as Christians, are now victims of a slow genocide. A genocide which is shattering those ancient communities to the point of their disappearance. And the numbers are significant. According to the report, 81% of Iraq's Christians have disappeared from Iraq. The remaining number of Sabaeans, an ancient community devoted to St. John the Baptist, is even smaller. 94% of them have disappeared. Another human rights organization, Hammurabi, said that Baghdad had 600,000 Christians in the recent past. Today there are only 150,000. And we complain about what? And we do what? You get it. These are some of the things that happened this week while you were busy. There are more. And we'll look at them next. Stay tuned.